I want to talk about why Paris is such an utter plonker, and that is being polite. I've taught the Iliad every year for about 11 or 12 years now, and every year I do not fail to become really quite unbelievably cross with Paris, and so do my students. So I've compiled a nice little list here. I'm going to go through it bit by bit, just showing you the general reasons why he doesn't deserve any praise at all, and then I'll go into a bit more detail for those of you with essays to write. So first of all, he has no honour. Why are the Greeks fighting Troy? Because Paris broke the xenia of his host, Menelaus, and stole his wife. You just don't. Two, he's downright cowardly. He challenges all the Greeks to a duel, shouting the equivalent of come and have a go if you think you're hard enough, whilst wearing a leopard skin like a total poser. And then he's surprised when the man whose wife he stole, Menelaus, takes him up on the offer and he hides. He actually hides. Three, he's ill-equipped. Once he accepts, oh no, sorry, once he is made to accept the duel with Menelaus, he actually has to borrow armour for it. He borrows his brother Lycaon's corselet because suddenly a leopard skin is not so appropriate. Four, He's undistinguished in battle. His performance in the duel is so bad, he only survives due to Menelaus' sword breaking, which is fluke, and Aphrodite breaking the neck strap that Menelaus is dragging him around by and choking him, before Aphrodite rescues him entirely from certain death. Five. He has no shame. After being deposited back in his bedroom by Aphrodite, he makes no effort to get back to the battlefield to remove the shame of his leaving it mid-battle. Instead, he forces Helen to sleep with him. Six. He really is just incredibly annoying. Any time that he is criticised, so for example, he's called strange man, woman crazed seducer, and is brother is the one who calls him most of these things. He then accepts the criticism and then laughs it off, saying it's not his fault that he's so beautiful. <gasps> oh. Seven. He is actually rubbish at archery. I'm sure some would like to think that he actually meant to hit Achilles in the only spot that could kill him ankle. I mean, really, who dies from an angro in the ankle? Um, but anyway, there is a precedent. In book 11 of the Iliad, he ruins Diomedes' run of deaths by shooting him in the instep from a distance whilst hiding behind a gravestone. Wow, what a guy. So I'll just run you through this here. What Paris wishes had happened is that he had hit Diomedes in the chest. He says as much. And considering he's hiding behind a gravestone to be able to hit him this far, you know, he would have had to compensate somewhat for the distance with his arrow shot. And he clearly didn't because what actually happens is the no compensation for distance aim and he hits him in the foot. This also suggests he was over a hundred foot away. And let's just remind ourselves again, he was hiding behind a gravestone at the time. And poor old Diomedes is, is, is kind of nonplussed, to be honest. Uh, and if you need more than that, um, there's this. In the Iliad, Helen hates him. His brother Hector, the most honourable man in the entire Iliad, hates him. And you can't feel sorry for him because he genuinely doesn't notice. So, one, no honour. In the Iliad, Hector tells Paris, our people are dying and it is because of you that the clamour of war is blazing round this city. That's in book six. So two, godlike Paris kept moving out in front of the Trojan ranks, wearing a leopard skin over his shoulders. Let's just remind ourselves that that is a hunting trophy. And a curved bow, again, for hunting and a sword shaking a couple of bronze capped spears okay finally that's actually appropriate but he's shaking them and rattling them as if to try and scare off an animal he constantly challenged all the best men of the argives to fight him one-to-one -one in grim combat but when godlike paris saw menelaus appear among the front fighters his heart quailed and he shrank back into the mass of his companions to avoid destruction 
Three, ill-equipped, again from book three. Next, he put a corselet around his chest. It was his brother Lycaon's and it fitted him, which frankly is just pretty lucky because, well, come on, he's having to borrow armour. Can I, I think that's enough. Um, four, undistinguished in battle, right? Technically, what happens here is divine intervention. A god actually comes down and changes the outcome of an event. This rarely happens. And in fact, in the film Troy, all goes wrong midway in the film because they choose not to include this. Um, and, and it's a really massive deal. Normally, the gods are there as the external representation of talent in mortals. They give Odysseus an idea. Come on, that's explainable. He has an idea. But this is actually Aphrodite coming down and getting involved. The fact that it's done for Paris so that he can then go and sleep with his wife really highlights how exceptionally rubbish he really is. Also, he only ever makes hits when using a bow and arrow, which is not a hand-to-hand -hand combat weapon. In the actual duel against Menelaus, he misses him with the spear. Okay, the, the bow and arrow is basically a sneaky gear weapon. There's no honour in this kind of fighting at this time. The only other example of it is in the Iliad, and uh, I've forgotten his name because he's so unimportant, and he hides behind Ajax's shield because he's his brother, and um, come on, pff, frankly, okay, Tusa, all right, fine, Tusa or Tuca, I don't even care anymore, because he's rubbish, anyway, there is no kind of honour in this fighting at the time, the duel in its completion is the most important thing, does he come back, embarrassed, oh my god, guys, I was just, I don't know what happened, I was in my bedroom, I thought I'd better come out here and fix it, no, five, he has no shame. Helen, after being forced to go to Paris's bedchamber by Aphrodite, who basically threatens to end her, she tells him in no uncertain terms that she wishes he was dead. He replies like a total creep, Wife, do not deride my courage with these hard taunts. This time Menelaus has beaten me with Athene's aid, and another time I shall beat him. There are gods on my side too. Edit, what? What? You were rescued by Aphrodite from a duel. A duel that in fact was solemnised by a sacrifice in order that the winner would take Helen home. You are not the winner. And yes, of course, I resist the urge to punch him in the face. No, let us come and enjoy the bed of love, he says to Helen, who hates him. Never before has desire so enveloped my heart. Not even that first time when I stole you away from lovely Lacedaemon and sailed off with you in my seafaring ships. This is from book six. In modern language, this is something like, I love it when you're angry and I want to rape you like I've never raped you before nice. When he goes to find him, Hector found Paris in the bedroom, fussing over his exquisite armour. Instead of being them in the male sphere of action, which is in the battlefield, he is in the bedroom where his wife is weaving, right? That's the female sphere of action. This is quite the wrong place for him to be. Also note that Helen is so annoyed with him, she's literally sitting there weaving and ignoring him. So... He's just sitting there playing with his armour. I mean, that's just awkward. Anyway, Hector berates him quite fairly for his behaviour and calls him strange man. No one in all fairness could belittle your success in battle. Edit, I beg to differ. See number seven. As you are a brave fighter, my edit. What? Um, but you deliberately hang back and refuse to fight. And my heart within me is pained at that when I hear the shaming things said of you by the Trojans who have much hardship to endure on your account. Now, frankly, Hector is being polite here. Paris replies to Hector in the most crawlingly obsequious way. Hector, your charge is not unfair, and there is justice in it. So I will tell you the truth, and you mark what I say and listen to me. It is not so much anger or resentment at the Trojans that has kept me sitting in my room, but I wanted to give way to my distress. But just now, my wife talked me round with gentle persuasion and urged me back to the war. And I think that would be best myself. Victory switches from man to man. So come now, wait for me while I put on my armour of war. Or you go on and I shall follow. I think I shall catch you. <laughs> Sorry, I can't really help laughing when I read his part. Yeah, right. The way his wife talked him round was to tell him that she wished he had died there, brought down by a man of strength. And basically her former husband Menelaus' hands. And 
she tells Hector, a man she actually respects, I wish I had been the wife of a better man than this, probably pointing at Paris, who is still in the room polishing his helmet, if you know what I mean. One who has had sense for men's outrage and all the shaming things they say, but this one has no wits in his head, no, and will never will in the future. And I think that he will meet the reward for that. So my final point is that uh, after Paris has finished speaking, so he spoke, and Hector of the glistening helmet made no answer. They are too right, he didn't. Six. He is really just incredibly annoying. Hector, your taunt is not unfair, and there is justice in it. Notice he says that before. But do not charge against me Aphrodite's lovely gifts. There is no discarding the glorious gifts that come from the gods' own giving, though a man would not take them of his choice. Book six again. Seven is rubbish at archery. This is this is frankly hilarious. Paris in book eleven was bending his bow against the son of Titus, Diomedes, shepherd of the people, leaning against the gravestone of Elis, son of Dardanus. It did not leave his hand in vain, but pierced the flat of Diomedes's foot, going right through it and fixing itself in the ground. Paris, with a hearty laugh, sprang forward from his hiding place and taunted him, saying, You are wounded! My arrow has not been shot in vain! Would that it had hit you in the belly and killed you? Diomedes answered, Archer, <laughs> not even mentioning Paris's name, you who without your bow are nothing, slanderer and seducer, if you were to be tried in single combat fighting in full armour, your bow and arrows would serve you little stead. Vain is your boast that you have scratched the sole of my foot. I care no more than if a girl or some silly boy had hit me. A worthless coward can inflict but a light wound. But when I wound a man, though I but graze his skin, it is another matter, for my weapon will lay him out. And then he basically limps off, ready to fight another day. Compare these reactions to the event in book six after Paris fails to complete his duel with Menelaus and is spirited away to his bedroom in Troy by Aphrodite and is cursed to his face by his wife and brother. Helen says to Hector, it is your mind above all others that the war's work besets, all for the sake of the bitch that I am and the blind folly of Paris. On us too, Zeus has set a doom of misery, so that in time we can be themes of, of song for men of future generations. These two people understand the seriousness of the war and the culture of shame, kudos and idos, in which they live. Paris's response is this. As soon as he had put on his splendid armour, he hurried off through the town at full speed, like a stallion who breaks his halter at the manger where they keep and fatten him, and gallops off across the fields in triumph to the bathing place in the delightful river. He tosses up his head, his mane flies back along his shoulders. He knows how beautiful he is, and away he goes, skimming the ground with his feet to the haunts and pastures of the mares. Shame, what shame? What's defeat? Is a knife grand? I'm a spalt golden child and I'm going to have sex. Aren't I pretty? The mares are the females, obviously. He is a stallion, a beautiful stud horse. They keep and fatten him. He's there for show and he's going in triumph despite the fact that he does not deserve a single bit of triumph to his bathing place in the river. He's off to have fun, to preen himself, not to the seriousness of war. And he's laughing. Oh God, I'm going to be sick. And then I remember this. Now this little nugget is a little Homeric aside from Iliad book 11. The sons of Antimachus are being captured by the Atreides. So the sons of Atreus, Menelaus and Agamemnon. Basically, this is in reference to something that happened before the action of the Iliad. Paris, Alexandros, bribed Antimachus not just to vote among the Trojans against giving Helen back to Menelaus when the Trojans met with the Achaeans to decide what to do, but to actually kill Menelaus while he was under the Xenia as ambassador in Troy. Maybe not so wise-hearted Antimachus after all. Wow, does that man, Paris, ever get his hands dirty? Just die already. 
All the quotations are from the Hammond and Rue translations and screenshots from the last bit of from the Perseus online text. I'm really glad to get that off my chest and I hope you will forgive my little rant. And for those of you writing essays on how Paris is frankly not fit to lick anyone's shoes, this, I hope, has been some help.